microphone speaking to you from my foyer office in the middle of a blizzard. So, it being a blizzard, I thought I would I thought I would put together a small compendium of something what I believe. This is Libertarian Her Heretic. This episode called Credo. This I believe. This is put together out of one, it was a chapter of a book uh, I was outlining, Libertarian Heretic, and a 14-year-old essay that I did some, well, obviously 14 years ago, uh, that outlined something about what I believe as well. So, the first part is called Some Basic Contentions, and it was probably inspired by Ayn Rand's uh, statement that civilization is the process of setting man free from man. Now, I have some problems with that statement, but but perhaps I would modify it by saying that a free society, free civilization, is the process of setting man free from man. So this series, like any other polemical work, has a point of view, which we call a POV, all caps, in the media biz, a set of assumptions that ally the themes in these uh, presentations. These are things that I believe to be true, this is about why I believe them to be true and why you should too. If you find you agree with all or most of these basic points, we're going to get along just fine. And I trust you'll find these episodes uh, entertaining and thought-provoking as long as I keep them fairly short. If you don't agree with any of them, well then, perhaps you'll experience the warm, self-righteous glow of uh, self-righteous indignation that comes from identifying another rat fink enemy of progress and all that is good. So, these are my basic contentions. Civilization is a good thing. The difference between civilized and savage is real and is not racism. Civilization can go bad, quite obviously, and when it does, it causes far more harm than any savage band ever could. Obviously, civilization could stand some improvement. History shows us that. The civilization most likely to improve and evolve into something better is that complex of cultures we call Western civilization. The reason for this is Western civilization has evolved cultural, we'll get to that, and political institutions that support a greater degree of individual liberty than any other civilization. The result has been an explosion of wealth and prosperity unequaled in human history. This has created its own problems. The Western cultures and countries which have achieved this to the greatest extent are the English-speaking countries, the so-called Anglosphere. There are reasons for this we will also get into. This is, by the way, not to denigrate any other civilization which, or any other country. To, all have contributed to some degree, but this is where Western civilization really shines, and this is where the Anglosphere has made the most progress. The Western country that has been most successful at this, to date, on a large scale at least, is the United States of America. The survival and success of liberty depends for the foreseeable future on the survival of Western civilization. The survival of Western civilization for the foreseeable future depends on the survival of the United States as a free country. Western civilization in general, and the United States in particular, have external enemies who desire their destruction. Western civilization in general, and the United States in particular, have internal enemies who desire their destruction and are willing to cooperate with their external enemies to bring this about. The internal enemies of the U.S. and the West come not from the ranks of the poor and dispossessed, but from the most affluent, educated, and privileged classes of their societies, the people you'd expect would have the most at stake at preserving their civilization. As an aside, see my ruling class crisis series, um, the episode entitled, Yes, They Really Hate America. The defenders of Western civilization and the tradition of individual liberty are divided among themselves. This is a good thing in terms of intellectual diversity and a bad thing in terms of coordinated action. 
there is a very real possibility of the United States breaking down into tyranny, disunity, disorder, or civil war, i.e. reverting to the norm of history. If this happens, the survival of the West is in serious doubt. The problem of free societies is how to be strong, rich, free, and united all at once. There has not yet been found a permanent solution to the problem. There may not be one. Okay, those are some basic contentions. Now I'd like to read you something, as I said, written 14 years ago. It won my, some sort of prize on, on the internet. Uh, I don't know. I was informed of it after the fact, and I've never heard from them since. But uh, during World, the Second World War, boxer Joe Lewis, the Brown Bomber, served in the U.S. Army as a spokesman or propagandist, we'd say today. Contrary to popular belief, the 60s generation did not discover racism and racial injustice. Watch any old movie on, uh, well, it was then the Turner Classics Movie Network, but, and you'll see that plenty of people had been bothered by it for some time. Nor did the fact that America was fighting two viciously racist regimes while treating black people as second-class citizens escape everybody's notice. Well, the story goes that at some point, in Lewis's army career, a journalist just straight up asked him how he felt about wearing the uniform of a country that treated him as second class. Lewis replied, America ain't got no problems Hitler can solve. So why is it that a pug with a high school education at best could see what a whole lot of highly educated and sophisticated intellectuals can't? His contemporary, the superbly talented singer Paul Robeson, declared that America was irretrievably corrupt and racist and threw his lot in with the Soviet Union. <clears throat> he paid a terrible price for this, and I don't mean for McCarthyism. While living there, he became complicit in the murder of his friend Ischak Pfeffer, which tortured his conscience till the day he died. His son gave us testimony of this. Robeson was a graduate of Columbia University. While Joe Lewis was in the Army, a migrant worker who had never seen the inside of a schoolhouse in his life, literal truth, moved to California and took a steady job as a longshoreman to help the war effort. A few years after the war ended, he published a book that astonished the intellectual community and added a new expression to the English language, The True Believer by Eric Hoffer, published in the year of my birth. Eric Hoffer saw America from very close to the bottom from the perspective of men who work at back-breaking seasonal labor or out of a hiring hall on a weekly or daily basis, and he did not find it wanting. Free men are aware of the imperfections in human affairs, and they are willing to fight and die for that which is not perfect. They know that basic human problems can have no final solution that our freedom, justice, equality, and so on are far from absolute, that the good life is compounded of half measures, compromises, lesser evils, and gropings towards the perfect. The reflections, the reflection of approximations and insistence on absolutes are the manifestations of a nihilism that loathes freedom, tolerance, and equity, he said. Hoffer sometimes spoke of the childish demand for perfection, and once asked, almost despairingly, is there any social order which would satisfy the disaffected artist and intellectual? I'm going to break from quoting him to brag that I have introduced Eric Hoffer to the academic establishment of two countries, Poland and Belarus, which, when <laughs> in the final day, when the names are counted, may count greatly against my sins. <clears throat> At any rate, to return, I have sometimes been accused of seeing things in black and white. This is not true. I'm afraid that I see things in black and gray, There, and I do not accept myself. There is no absolute good I've ever seen, but there are certainly there certainly exists what answers pretty closely for absolute evil. What I find disturbing is that a lot of intellectual types in our country and Europe seem to be taking the position that since what we have is not perfect, it's not worth defending against that which would destroy it and replace it with something immeasurably worse. Or even that it deserves to be destroyed no matter what replaces it. That's the nihilism that Hoffer spoke of. 
Now I have a confession. I used to hold views very much like these back when I was a young intellectual. What changed my mind? I don't really know. Perhaps it had something to do with the experience of working a total of six years as a garbage man back when we carried the loads on our back and another half dozen as a sewage treatment plant worker, which is close enough to the bottom of society, prestige-wise at least. And it's not so bad. It's not terrible. Perhaps it was living in Eastern Europe for 13 years and seeing how our last rival ideology turned once flourishing countries into something like third world slums. And ultimately having children, which drove home to me the importance of protecting and conserving and preserving <laughs> conserving as in conservative, what this civilization of ours did right and leaving something our kids can build on and improve. This presumes that we can educate them and prepare them for that task and that job seems to be in the hands of those intellectuals. <laughs> Is there anyone who wears that title, intellectual, who will speak for our country and our civilization? enough, one of the best expressions of this I heard was a Democrat, Irish Paul, brought up in machine politics, who happened to be an intellectual. Am I embarrassed to speak for a less than perfect democracy? Not one bit. Find me a better one. Do I suppose there are societies which are free of sin? No, I don't. Do I think that ours is, on balance, incomparably the most hopeful set of human relations in the world? Yes, I do. That was Daniel Patrick Moynihan. With that, thank you very much. Good morning. I probably have to go shovel some snow now.